from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same let the name of the Lord be praised and both now and forevermore all of heaven and earth proclaim let the name This Wednesday night, we will have adult Bible study in here for those of you that do not want to go skating. Uh, but if you would like to go skating, the church has rented out the Jackson Skate Park, and it's for chil our children and our student ministries. Adults are welcome. Just please don't fall and hurt something like I would. But if you want to go skate, go skate. If not, we will be here having adult Bible study uh, for that this coming Wednesday night. Next Sunday is fifth Sunday in July. And we have a very exciting, creative thing we do here at Macedonia, and it's called Fifth Sunday. And what we're going to do is in that morning, we celebrate communion together. It is the entire Sunday morning service. It's not a tag on. We do it the whole way through the service. So you're going to want to be here and experience communion with us. At 5 o'clock, we have what's called our starting point class. And this is for families that have an interest in learning more about our church. Maybe God is kind of leading you to consider partnering with us and becoming a member you can come and learn more about the church. People do that, and they will leave the class and say, hey, give me a week. We want to pray about this some more. 
or if you're ready to join and partner with us, you can come to that class and do that as well. We will have refreshments for you, drinks. We will take care of your kids. All you got to do is scan the code, sign up online, let us know you're coming, and we'll be ready for you. After starting point class on fifth Sunday at 6 o'clock, we have a church-wide fellowship. And this Sunday night, this coming Sunday night, to end summer and get ready for school, y'all excited? We're going to have a, food, a taco West Coast burrito food truck, absolutely free. All you got to do is show up and eat, go up to the food truck outside, get your food, come inside here, and we're going to have a family feud and $100,000 pyramid and other fun family game night, 6 o'clock, absolutely free. Just come hang out with us and enjoy being a faith family as we get ready to kick back off school. Uh, this is the fourth Sunday. So kids, what happens on the fourth Sunday at 5 o'clock? Impact Kids happens today at 5. Thank you, Miss Nancy. So if you have a K through 5th grader, 5 o'clock in the link, we have a one-hour program designed just for children, music, games, crafts. It's a lot of fun. You're going to want to be here for that. And then the final thing I want to mention that we are so excited about, you guys may know Jason Reagan. I know you know Jason. He is our development pastor. And what that means is he's responsible for discipleship, small groups. How do we grow in our faith in smaller groups? That's his whole role. And behind the scenes, he's been working on what we call impact groups. And we are launching for the very first time a new series of impact groups in September. And at the end of the service, I'm going to be in the back to greet our visitors. Jason will be back there with me. If you want to sign up for one, you want to learn how to host one, maybe you want to lead one, come get with Jason. This is going to become the core and the backbone of who we are as a church. How we communicate and how we connect in small groups in various ways. On campus, off campus, in homes, in coffee shops. However God leads us, we're going to connect and reach people. You good with that? So those are coming up here pretty soon. So if you're visiting with us online or on campus, if you're online, we have our virtual camp staff available. If you're just put in the chat, bo chat box, let us know where you're visiting from. We'd love to interact with you. If you have questions throughout the service, you can interact with them. If you are on campus, we want you to know you're a special guest of ours as well. And at the end of the service, I'll be in the back. The church has a gift for you. All you have to do is come by and say hello to me and shake my hand. It is hot in Jackson, and we're going to treat you to some ice cream on the square. You just have to come by and say hello to us and let us know you were here, all right? So let's stand up together. I'm going to pray for us, and we'll continue our time of worship. Father, we love you, and God, we thank you for your love for us. And Lord, we recognize this morning as we gather as a faith family, the only way we can even comprehend and know what love is is because you showed us. You didn't sit at a distance and give us rules and regulations, but God, you took on flesh, you came among us, you walked among us, you ate with us, you communicated, you showed us what life really is. And so Lord, this morning, I pray for all of us in the room that we would take a minute and pause, we would take a deep breath and breathe in worship, we would breathe in fellowship with other believers, and we would breathe in the beautiful word of God that is enduring forever, and God, that you would change us because of this time we spend together. Lord, I'm thankful to be able to serve alongside this faith family and what you're doing here at this church, what you're doing in the community, and God, how you're going to use us in the future to reach the world with the gospel of the Lord Jesus. So God, help us to walk in faithfulness to you. Let us encourage one another today in this time we have. Let us, let us lift our voices in worship to our creator and our redeemer, and may everything that is said and done bring you glory. And we ask this in Christ's name, amen. Well, good morning. Um, so before we, before we continue our time of worship, I just wanted to uh, introduce a couple of friends that I have on stage here. Uh, the guy on the far right, you probably remember Linwood. So we're really glad Linwood's here. And, uh, and the gentleman in the middle is a very special guest. Um, some of you may be thinking that you've seen him before, and you probably have. He's been in gospel music for a long, long time, and we're very fortunate to have him uh, here with us in leading worship for us. So if you don't mind, just make John McBroom feel welcome. I 
Who you are 
are way maker. You are way maker, promise keeper, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, no, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider. Church, sing it out. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe is great. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God, to Well, amen. What a great time of worship. Mm. If you got your Bibles, jump over to Psalms chapter 8. Psalms chapter 8. And this morning we're wrapping up our series, A Summer in the Psalms. And if you've been hanging out with us for a little bit of time, you know we're looking at different words, basically, as we work through the book of Psalms. Not really working through the book of Psalms, but different chapters. That would take us a lifetime to get through the whole book. And the whole point of it was this thought, that in the summertime, a lot of people take a break. They're busy with work, they're busy with family, they're doing all kind of stuff, and they go to the beach, they go to the mountains, they go visit family, some people do staycations. But at some point over the summer, they take advantage of a break and they just rest, try to. If you're like some families, maybe vacation is super busy for you and you have to take a vacation from your vacation, you run so much on vacation. But the point is we try and find time in our busy schedules to just sit and pause. And a lot of times on those vacations, as we're driving, flying, sitting by the beach, sitting at dinner, sitting in the hotel room, condo with family, we start to have conversations about life. What has life been like? We tell stories. We think about where life is headed. We may dream a little bit about what the future may hold for us. And the whole point of it is we're just kind of relaxing a little bit. And so part of what we wanted to do over this summer was do that. We wanted to turn to the book of Psalms and say, let's take a pause and think about a few key words to encourage us and refresh our souls. And what we learned was that 74 times in the book of Psalms, David uses this word called selah. And it's really hard to interpret. There's a lot of different opinions about what it means, but the most common opinion is that it means to pause. And David many times would write it in his Psalms, and it was an indicator to people that were either singing in worship or playing an instrument that after they had sung or played a certain section and they saw the word selah, they would stop. And they would think about what was just said or what was just played. They would reflect on and consider who God was to them. And so that's where this whole series comes from, Summer in the Psalms. Let's just take a selah, let's pause and think about the greatness and the goodness of God and what he's done for us. And so the first week we talked about the word forgetfulness. And we learned through the psalm we studied that Sunday, if you were here, that the children of Israel would walk with God for a while, then they would turn to idols, God would rebuke them and correct them, and they'd repent and turn back to God, and then they'd go right back to doing it again. And it was this constant cycle, and it would say the children of Israel turned to God, and then they forgot his love for them, and he would have to address that. But what was amazing was if you read down through that text, it got to a point where God said, and he forgot their rebellion. It's an amazing picture of who God is. And so the main truth for us that Sunday is many times we forget God's love for us, and God always forgets our rebellion. It's amazing that that's how his character works. In the second week, we talked about blessed. 
the word blessed, what does it really mean to be blessed? We use it a lot in Christian language. We looked at Psalms chapter 1, and one of the things we learned that Sunday was that we receive blessing. Genesis tells us we are blessed as God's creation. Ephesians tells us we are blessed in spiritual things, and we have all that we need to live the life God has created us to live. But why don't we feel blessed? Why don't we really experience blessed? And Psalms chapter 1 taught us that blessing is something we receive and also something we must choose. And that's why he says, blessed is the man who does not walk, stand, or sit in the counsel of the wicked, the sinners, and scoffers. We have to choose that. And then last week, we talked about forgiveness. Forgiveness. And that's where David came and said, man, blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven, whose transgressions are covered up, whose iniquity God does not remember anymore. And we thought about and paused on what does it mean to truly be forgiven of God? that everything is removed, that in essence he said it is as if we never even committed the sin. That's what forgiveness looks like. It's an amazing thing to think about. This morning, we're going to talk about a little different word that you don't hear a lot in the church, but it's really powerful when I was studying this text. It's, it's a little bit hard to get our brain around, but we're going to do the best we can this morning. It is this word called majestic. Majestic. And so when you think about the word majestic, it may be hard for us to comprehend that. So we're going to try and categorize it, show some visual images on the screen to help us move our thoughts toward this thing called majestic. But let me share with you this. Apollo 11 carried to the moon, and it should be on the screen behind us in a second, a goodwill disc that had a message from 73 countries. This thin silicon disc was left in a simple cloth pouch in an aluminum case by the Sea of Tranquility in July of 1969 by astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. At the top of the disc is the inscription, Goodwill Messages from Around the World Brought to the Moon by the Astronauts of Apollo 11, thinking that if anybody was out there as a life form and they found this disc, there would be goodwill messages to those people. Around the rim is the statement, from planet Earth, July 1969, in tiny type, you cannot really see it on the screen, but in tiny type, etched into the surface are goodwill messages from world leaders. So when this space shuttle was going up and they wanted to take this disc up, they approached the Vatican, and they asked the Vatican to put a goodwill message to any life form that might be out there and may find this. And the Vatican decided to put part of the Bible on there as their goodwill message. And if you had a chance to put a part of the Bible, Scripture, on a disc and plant it on the moon, what would you pick? The Vatican picked Psalms 8. And they put it on the moon. It is supposedly the first Bible text to ever reach the moon. So if you have your Bibles, look at Psalms chapter 8, and let's look what the Vatican chose to put up there, and it's still there today, and the impact it could have on us. We're going to read through this whole chapter. It's only nine verses. Look what it says. Lord our Lord. Now pay attention. I'm going to come back and explain this in a second, but you'll notice the first word Lord is all capitalized. The second word Lord, just the L is capitalized. That is significant. And I'll explain that in a second. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. Let's just take a time out right there. I cannot get into that verse today, but it is powerful. And in essence, what David is saying, you think about how when we did our spiritual warfare series a few months ago, strongholds that get developed in our life and how hard it is for us to uproot those against our spiritual enemy. David says, through the praise of children and infants, that is like minor children that are still nursing all the way up through what we would consider children, look what he says, you have established a stronghold against your enemies. You know what David is communicating? That God will use the weak and the frail to do amazing things. And that's what he's speaking about us. It is majestic that God would take an infant child, put praise in their mouth, and use it to be a stronghold against the enemy. That builds out. We don't have time to get into that verse, but that's what he's saying. Verse 3, when I considered your heavens... The work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. Look at his question. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you even care for us. You have made them a little lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor. Good question to ask yourself right there is how do you see yourself? If you were to pause this morning and think about how do you view yourself? Many of us would say, I don't have a really good 
liking of myself. Matter of fact, a lot of days I kind of hate myself. I, I don't like who I am. David writes and says, when I consider the greatness, God, of what you've created and what you've done, the beauty of it all, and then I look at mankind and I think, why would you care about us? And then he goes on to say, but you have crowned us with glory and honor. Look what he says in verse 6. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. Does that not blow your mind? You put everything under their feet, all the flocks, all the herds, all the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. And then he wraps it up again with this same statement. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So here, what, what we find in Psalms chapter 8, and we're going to work through this, is there's three wonderful and important truths about man found in the psalm. When these three truths are denied or neglected, man never is what God made him to be. Don't miss that statement. When the three truths I'm about to show you are not pulled together and put in a bundle, if you will, we will never be what God made us to be. The first truth is this, God made man. The God who with his finger and with his spoken word created the universe and everything that we see and everything that we know, he made man for purpose. The second truth, God made man something glorious. God made us to be glorious. He made us to be majestic, which is hard for us to get our brain around, but it's the truth. The third thing I would tell you is this, God made man for a high and worthy destiny. And I'm going to show you as we walk through this scripture, one of the things the Bible tells us clearly is that God made man, he made us for something glorious, and he made us for a future destiny. And you say, what is that future destiny? Listen, for now, we are a little lower than the angels. Do you realize the Bible says when he returns and he establishes his kingdom, we as the crown jewel of his creation go above angels and we are given a crown of glory and honor. Think about that. That's what God says is true about you. Because of the wonderful love of God creating us, out of everything he created, he says we are the achieving creation. And one day we will be put above angels. We talked a little bit about this on Wednesday night. If you join us, you think about the apostles. You know heaven tells us, the Bible tells us that heaven has 12 stones as its foundation. And in each stone is etched one of the names of the apostles. Can you imagine if you were Peter, you're just a fisherman out fishing, and one day the Messiah shows up and says, come follow me. And as your life advances, he turns to you and says, I'm going to etch your name in the stone of heaven. Think about that. Peter, a fisherman from the Middle East, name is on the foundation of heaven. It's mind-blowing to think about a majestic God would take us and do that. All three of these principles are rooted in what God has made man to be. They do not exist, nor are they fully from the work of man. Don't miss that. This sermon this morning, if you doze off after this, get this point. This sermon this morning is not to talk about how great we are. You with me on that? It is really not about man. It is about a majestic God who elevates man beyond anything we can comprehend because that's the kind of God he is. That's what the sermon is about. There's a gentleman named Boyce. Here's what he said. The most striking feature of Psalm 8 is its description of man and his place in the created order. But watch this. But the psalm does not begin by talking about man. It begins with a celebration of the surpassing majesty of God. That's the point of the sermon. This majestic God who elevates man to a status that we don't deserve, and it kind of blows our mind, but it should absolutely cause us to pause and change about how we, how we think about God and how we think about ourselves. So look what he says, Psalms 8.1. He says, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And if you notice, as I mentioned a minute ago, he starts out with Lord in all capitals. And in our language, we might just view that as, Doug, Doug, do you want to go to Zaxby's? And we'd be like, why did you say my name twice? That's kind of weird. But in Bible times, it had significant meaning. And the reason he said all capitals, he was referring to God as Yahweh God. What he was saying was, whether people recognize it or not, God, you are self-sustaining, self-creating. You don't need anybody. You are Lord, all capital. You get that? He is trying to communicate a message to us about the character of who God is. He is all caps Lord, whether you believe it or not. Doesn't matter. He is. Then he puts in this 
capital L, lowercase letters. Lord, self-sustaining, self-creating, whether people accept it or not, you are Lord, our Lord. See the difference what he's saying? He's saying not only are you Lord and creator of everything, whether people accept it or not, you are my Lord. You are personal, you are intimate, you are close to me, and he is close to you. This is the type of Lord he is. How majestic is your name in all the earth. It was a very simple way for David in a straightforward manner in a common way in their time to say our God is our master that's what he's saying in that first verse our God is our master he is Lord of our life then he follows it up and says this how majestic is your name in all the earth David also recognized that though he was Lord all caps he was Israel's covenant God he chose them he made a promise to them but he says you're also of God of not just Israel your majestic name is in all the earth think about that all tribes all countries all people you are majestic in all of it over the entire earth he says you have set your glory in the heavens at the same time God is so majestic that the earth was not enough to measure the glory of God and the excellence of God so it says your glory is in all the heavens now that is really hard for us to get our brain around because all we think about the best we could probably get to is a flight we might take you with me on that? We get in a plane, we go up 30,000, depending on how far you fly, maybe a little bit higher if you're doing an international flight. That's about what we can get our brain around. But when you blow out what the heavens really means, it is mind-blowing to think about David saying, you have set your glory in the heavens. And I'm going to try and help us understand that. So Webster, if you were thinking about what does majestic really mean? Let's walk through this. Webster defines it this way. It means impressive or beautiful in a dignified or inspiring way. You might agree with that. If I asked you what does majestic mean to you, you might not word it just like Webster did. But you would get close to that. It's something impressive. It's something beautiful. It's dignified. It inspires us. That's majestic. The other thing it says, it possesses or exhibits majesty. That's kind of hard for us to get our brain around. Maybe we could think about a queen, you know, when she shows up, how the majestic nature of that event and who she is and what they do in that country. Having qualities of splendor. These are the ways that Webster defines majestic, and I would tell you when it comes to defining God, they all fall short. They all fall short. It's hard for us to understand. If you look up majestic in Google Images, you'll find all kind of stuff. This is what I did this week. I looked up majestic. I wonder what people think of when they hear majestic visually. So the first one that came up was a beautiful sunset or sunrise, depending on how you view the picture. But the point is, when you see something like that, and you're on vacation, and you get up in the morning, and you go out and walk on the beach at night, and you see that, there's a part of you, you may not think the word majestic, but there is something in you that connects, that resonates. But this is beautiful. This is inspiring. This means something. People say that's majestic. Another one, if you see the moon sitting out over the waters, you could see that at night. And you might say, that is majestic. That is beautiful. That is inspiring to me. Or the most recent image that NASA sent back to us from the newest satellite they sent up and you see a distant stars and you may say that is amazing that is majestic but it still falls short of what God is what he has done and what he will do so listen here's some facts with the naked eye our own eye if you just walk out and look up on a clear night we're not talking about downtown Atlanta we're talking about a clear night no pollution and you look up the naked eye can see about 5,000 stars so think about David, out in a pasture, maybe tending sheep when he wrote this, clear blue sky, and he looks up, he can see about 5,000 stars. And in his mind, he begins to process, God, how majestic is your name? You made all that with the stroke of your finger, and it starts to resonate, he starts to feel it. Science tells us that with a four-inch telescope, one can see about two million stars, with just a four-inch telescope. With a 200-inch mirror within a great observatory, one can see more than a billion stars. So it builds. Now think about it. David couldn't do that. They didn't have those kind of things back then. He is just with his naked eye processing what he sees. Here's some other facts that NASA give us, gives us. The universe is so big that if one were to travel at the speed of light, now listen to this. This is kind of science, but hang in there. Speed of light. You know what the speed of light is? It's 186 thousand miles per second you might do 80 hope you don't you might running down the interstate no jason drives fast he probably does 
You might do 80 down the inter- 80 miles an hour. The speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. You know what that tells us? NASA says if you went the speed of light, you could circle, circumvent the globe seven and a half times in one second if you traveled the speed of light. That's amazing. There's a reason I'm telling you this. The universe is so big that if one were to travel at the speed of light, it would take four billion years to reach the end of what we know as the universe today. Think about that, 186,000 miles per second. If that was the speed you were traveling, it would take you 40 billion years to get to the end of the universe of what they've discovered today. And David looks up and says, God, that is majestic. That with your spoken word and the stroke of your finger, you would make that. It's mind-blowing to think about. The spi- one more, the spiral galaxy of Andromeda. It's going to be on the screen behind us. They tell us it's as large as our Milky Way. It is one of 100 million galaxies. One of 100 million galaxies in our universe. It is 750,000 light years away. So if you think about, well, what's a light year? Let me, NASA explains it this way. A light year is roughly 6 trillion miles. Can you fathom that? 6 trillion. I live 22 miles from the church. How long would it take me to do 6 trillion miles? That's what one light year is. And this galaxy is 750,000 times 6 trillion miles away from us. It's, incre- it's crazy. In that galaxy, Andromeda, it consists of 100 billion suns, and each one of them is larger than our own sun. And what happens when we walk through this, you picture David in this pasture, he has no access to NASA telescopes, he's just looking up, processing. But when you hear those facts and you think about the galaxy, and David considers it, and he comes to the conclusion that says, that is majestic. That there is a God who could speak that, that with the brush of his finger could bring it into being. And here you and I sit on this planet. And that same God, when you get up in the morning and you cry to him in prayer, you know what he does? He moves close. That's crazy to think about. The Bible tells us he's close to the brokenhearted. The same God that can create such distance, such massive space. When we're brokenhearted and we reach out to him, he moves close crazy to think about how majestic he is david wrote in psalms 19 just listen to these words the heavens declare the glory of god the skies proclaim the work of his hands day after day they pour forth speech night after night they reveal knowledge to us they have no speech they use no words no sound is heard from them yet their voice goes out into all the earth everybody can see it the stars and the sun The words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. Think about this. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run its course. It rises as one end of the heavens, and it makes its circuit to the other, and nothing is deprived from its warmth. This is David and his finite thinking, sitting in a pasture, processing the majesty of God, and writes that about the sun. And here we are. Barely even a blip on the radar, not even a blip on the radar in the grand scheme of what's out there. But yet God knows us and he cares for us. When we consider Psalms 8, 4, along with these surrounding verses, we see that the psalmist, David, is praising the Lord for granting such a superior position in his creation. Look what he says in Psalms 8, 3 through 4. When I consider your heavens, the things we just looked at, the work of your fingers, The moon and the stars which you have set in place. Look at this question. What is mankind that you're mindful of them? Human beings that you would even care for them. Isn't that a great question to come to? A great conclusion. God, if you are so majestic, why do you care? Why do you care that I'm hurting? Why do you care that I'm struggling? Why do you care that I pray for peace in my heart? It seems so trivial when it comes to the greatness, but that's how he is. In this passage, the Hebrew Hebrew word translated man refers to humanity. It's all of us. It's a general and it emphasizes the transience and weakness of us. He is saying, what is mankind that you would pay attention to the weaknesses that we have? When David was looking at the vastness and the splendor of the universe, human beings to him were so small and insignificant. 
Considering the majesty and preeminence of the moon and stars God has created, David wonders, what are human beings amount to? That you, O God, would take them into account. Then he answers his own question. Look what he says in verses 5 through 8. He says, you have made them a little lower than the angels. You ever thought about that position you have in Christ? Just a little lower than the angels for now. You've made them a little lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the work of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all the flocks, all the herds, all the animals of the wild, the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. If that doesn't kind of get us to pause and say a lot on that for a second, that out of everything God created, he brought up mankind and said to us, you are the rulers of it all. That's mind-blowing for us to process that. You have crowned them with glory and honor, though for a little while we are set lower than the angels. Man's destiny, our ultimate destiny, one day is to be crowned with glory and honor that surpasses even the angels. Think about the beauty and the majesty of an angel. How when they showed up, people would fall almost dead. They would be so scared and the roar of their voices and the Bible says God is so majestic that he elevates man to a position that says your glory, your crown, one day will be greater than the angels. It's hard for us to get our brain around that. It is the destiny of the redeemed men and women to one day be lifted above the angels. It may seem that this divine call and gift to man with great dominion over the whole earth is tragically unfulfilled, right? Think about it. It is tragically unfulfilled today. Fallen man, we seem so weak and incapable of dominion even over our own thoughts and desires. You with me in that? Even now, we struggle to get victory over our own thoughts and desires. It is hard for us to process that one day God would give us dominion and put us above the angels and let us rule with him because I can't even get my own life straight now. And so we struggle through that thought process. This is why it's a text about God, not about you, not about me. It's stuff that I don't deserve. It's stuff that you don't deserve. It is the work of God, the majestic creator of the universe, made a choice that humankind would be the crowning glory of his creation, even in our weaknesses. In view of God's handiwork and the limitless, limitlessness of his creation, David is awestruck by the Lord's concern for humans and the position that he gives them one day to rule. So in the mind and heart of God, here's what I would tell you. Here's what I want you to understand. One of the main truths today. In the mind and heart of God, people are his foremost concern. Pause and think on that. In his mind and in his heart, as big as the universe is, bigger than we can probably even get our head around, and they will continue to study and research it and bring back data and information, the foremost thing on his heart and his mind is you. Is you. And so as you struggle, and you question, and you wrestle, God says, I'm right there with you. It's crazy to think about his love and his compassion for us. Job, instead of being captivated by God's attention, Job got caught up in his misery and suffering, and he wishes the Lord would leave him alone. Remember the story of Job? He kind of goes the opposite way of David, but he gives us a great verse with tremendous truth that ties into this. But Job was not sitting back and saying, God, how great are you? How majestic are you? Job was saying, God, I'm tired of suffering. Please leave me alone. But look what he writes in Job 7, 17 through 19. He says, what is mankind that you make so much of them, that you give them so much attention, that you examine them every morning and test them every moment? That was Job's question. God, why do you care so much for us is what he was asking. In the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews references Psalm chapter 8, verse 4. It's not going to be on the screen, but I want you to listen to this. This is out of the New Living Translation. It's just a simpler way for us to grasp this truth. But the writer of Hebrews references Psalm 8, 4, and this is what he says. For in one place the scriptures say, Psalms chapter 8, verse 4, one place the scriptures say, what are mere mortals that you should think about them, or a son of man that you should care for them? Yet for a little while you made them a little lower than the angels, and you crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them authority over all things. Now when it says all things, this, this is right out of Scripture, when it says all things, it means nothing is left out. But we have not yet seen all things put under their authority. What we do see is Jesus, who for a little while 
was given a position a little lower than the angels. And because he suffered death for us, he is now crowned with glory and honor. And if you scratch your head and say, Doug, what does that text have to do with what we're talking about? The writer of Hebrews is saying, what we saw Jesus do and what we saw him experience, being raised from the dead, ascended to heaven, seated at the right hand of God, crowned with glory and honor, will be ours one day too. Now, you and I will not sit at the right hand of God. That's the place of Jesus. But that resurrection to life, the crowning of glory and honor, the position of all things being under your feet will happen. And you may scratch your head and say, well, who am I to have authority over all things, over created things? It's not about you. It's about the work of God, the majestic work of God on your behalf and my behalf. That's what it's about. The writer of Hebrews references this Old Testament passage to show that Jesus was truly human. He was, in fact, God incarnate. Psalms 8-4 was the fulfillment in Jesus Christ. He humbled himself and became a human being. In his earthly ministry, he allowed himself to be positionally a little lower than the angels. And as a man, he willingly experienced suffering and death just as we do. Why? The Bible tells us he tasted death for everyone. He took on our nature, became like us, but without the sin and rebellion that tarnish us, and that through his death, Jesus broke the power of death for all of us. It no longer has dominion over us. It no longer has victory over us because of what Christ has done. Hebrews 2 goes on to say this, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son, being Jesus, also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives slaves to the fear of dying. Do you hear the power of that text? The only way we could be set free from the fear of death is for Jesus to become a little lower than the angels, put on human flesh just like we did, allow men to nail him to a cross and take his physical life. It's the only way he could set us free from the fear of death. And for those that say, I believe Jesus was the Messiah and I believe that death on the cross was for me, the Bible says, the majestic nature of God is past. It's mind-blowing. Jesus became human and died to set us free from death. And as David begins to walk through this text, he starts to ask, what is man that you care? What is man that you would want to have anything to do with us? What is man after we turn and rebel and make our own choices and don't decide to follow your ways? Why do you care? Why do you forgive? Why do you restore? because it's in his majestic nature to do it. So it's interesting to me that as David processes these thoughts, he comes to the end in verse 9. And he says it again, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And I would tell you as you take a break, you take a selah over the summer, and you think about majestic, that simple verse is a great one to think about today and this week as you go throughout your days. You go to lunch, as you're sitting at home, working in your yard, whatever you do today, just think about that. Lord, all caps, ruler, sustainer over everything. Our Lord, is he personal to me? Do I know him? First-hand knowledge. How majestic is your name in all of the earth? There is nothing more majestic, nothing more beautiful, nothing greater than who God is and what he has done for us. It is amazing when I think about my life and I've lived enough, I'm not old, I'll be 50 this year, so I've not lived enough life to really consider myself wise, but I've lived enough that I don't consider myself dumb either, in some aspects. And one thing that constantly just amazes me is the, the more I age and the more I walk with God and the more mistakes I make, you with me on that? The more mistakes I make and the more I turn to God and say, God, I do not understand why. I do not understand who I am, why. Do I do those things? And I experience the forgiveness and the love of Jesus in my life, the more the fact that he is majestic becomes real. Does that make sense? People that have never come to a place that you truly understand what it means to hurt, to suffer, to be broken because of your sin and of your choices and your rebellion against God, 
and have a father who moves to you in forgiveness and says, I love you just like you are, not as you think you should be, that's when you start to understand majesty. Why, God, would you care for me? All the things in the universe. Why would you appoint me one day to glory and honor and to rule with you and put everything under my feet? I can't even manage my own house. I can't even sometimes make a right decision about taking the trash out. And you're going to put everything under my feet? It's hard for us. That's why this verse is saying, don't focus on you. Look to Jesus. Look to God. He's the majestic one. He's the one that's doing that work for us. So I hope this morning as we stand to close out our service and our praise team comes forward, I hope this morning you'll take this to heart. That you will realize in the eyes of God how wonderful you and I really are. I need you to focus because I know there's a lot of distractions with the praise team moving around. But listen, I firmly believe in the world we live in today, people struggle all the time with their self-worth. You with me on that? Especially our young people. They struggle with their self-worth. Do I matter enough? Do people notice? Do I look right? Do I fit in? And I want to tell you, God created you just like he wanted you. You are perfect in his eyes. And you may say, well, I don't feel that way. I don't think I have the right hair. I don't drive the right car. I don't have the right clothes. Whatever it is we get caught up in, I'm telling you, God made you the way you are. And he made you with purpose. And he loves you just like you are. And all he wants us to do is be who he made us to be and walk with him. So I want to say that as a word of encouragement. That's something to think about from this text. God made you just like you are. You are majestic in his eyes, and he loves you. And I want to tell those in the room this morning, if you have never in your life come to a place that you truly believe in who Jesus is and what he did for you, I would love nothing more than to show you from the Bible. I do not have all the answers. I am a frail, broken guy who tries his best to walk with the Lord. And I would love to show you about God's love, what he's done for me, what I've experienced, what many of you have experienced. You can be forgiven. You have never gone too far to outrun the love and the majesty of who God is for you. And then for some of you this morning that you know Jesus, you walk with him, you just need to take a break. Let yourself off the hook a little bit. Realize that you are the apple of God's eye. You are his shining glory of his creation. And he has a wonderful purpose in the time that you're on this earth. And he has a wonderful purpose for you ahead. So walk with him. Know him. Lean in on him. Let him be your God. So let's stand together. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. And God, it is somewhat mind-blowing to pause and think about these thoughts when we understand how big and vast the created world is and the universe is god we're not even a blip on the radar but yet we are the created ones that when we cry out in prayer you listen we are the ones that you say come before me with confidence and boldness ask whatever it is you want to ask in my name God, we are the ones that you entrusted the gospel to, this treasure in a jar of clay. God, out of everything you created, we are the ones that you said, be my ambassador. Go forward and represent the kingdom. And Father, it is mind-blowing because we know how frail, we know our mistakes, we know what we struggle with. And it's hard for us to see ourselves as you see us. So, Spirit of God, bridge that gap for us. Help us to see the way God sees, just for a moment. Lord, I pray that this message would not come across as touting the greatness of man. That, God, it would be about the majesty and the glory of our Creator. And that He loves us so much that Jesus would come, put on flesh, walk among us. Know what it was to be hungry. Know what it was like to lose a loved one. To be persecuted. To be mocked. And God, that he would willingly allow men to nail him to a cross. So that he could beat death for all of us. 
Lord, I pray for those in the room that don't know you, Spirit of God, quicken in their heart, convict them of sin, but help them to see the love of Jesus towards them. And we pray all this in Christ's name, amen. tried him for crimes he hadn't done. No one else believed, but I just knew he was the one. And I slid back into the crowd, trying to go unseen. But when Pilate cried out, be he pointed straight to My friends, they all cheered me as I took the whip in hand, placing stripes upon the back of this guiltless man. The way he turned and looked at me from my mind I can't erase. I'll never forget the look on his face he said i'm doing this for you i will still love you when you're through i'm doing this for Though it took me by surprise When I saw love in his eyes He said, I'm doing this for you High atop Mount Calvary With hammer and nail It became my duty Crucify this man. I heard my friends gambling for his robe at my side. But I couldn't turn away as he looked into my eyes. Father, forgive them. I heard him cry aloud. Behold the King of Kings. Someone mocked from the crowd, and then the crown shook and the thunder rolled as he gave up the ghost. But until the day I die, the thing that I'll remember most, he said, I'm doing this for you. And I I'm doing this for you. Though it took me by surprise when I saw love in his eyes, he said, I'm doing this for you. The sacrifice that day at Calvary was the Father's perfect plan to set man free. And I'm doing this for you. And I will still love you when you're through. I'm doing took me by surprise when I saw love in his eyes. I'm doing this for you. 
Though it took me by surprise When I saw love in his eyes I'm doing this for you. Amen. You are dismissed.